This is episode 85 of the Christian Travelers Network. Today we're going to be talking about airport adventures. Welcome to the Christian Travelers Network, where travel stories, community, and scripture combine. Hey, Christian Travelers, what is up? I'm so excited to be talking to you about different types of travel, and the one for this week is flying. Now, many of you have flown before, so maybe this won't all be new information for you, but it's always a good refresher, especially after how many months of COVID, and maybe you're not flying anytime soon, but when you do next, it is a good idea to have some of these things in mind. Now, if you've never traveled before, this will be a lot of new and exciting information for you, Um, and I'll share a little bit of some of my own uh, flying adventures with you. So, when it comes to flying, the first thing that comes to mind is booking your flights. Now, there's all kinds of different things, but Tuesday slash Wednesday is the recommended time to actually book a flight. Um, Do your research ahead of time. Use kayak.com. Use us, christiantravelers.net. We have a lot of suppliers who offer really ridiculously good deals um, to book flights at cheaper costs um, and just be in contact with us. But if you are booking it yourself, make sure to clear your search engine before you do because They kind of keep track of what you're frequently searching. If you're researching Orlando to Houston on certain dates and you've looked for it multiple times, they begin to slowly kind of increase that price on you. So clear your search engines before you book, and um, once you've booked that, uh, you should be good to go. International flights, I recommend being six to eight months out, is usually the cheapest prices that you're going to get. Um, with domestic flights, it's usually about two months out is the best time to book. Um, if it's before then or after then, you're going to see higher prices. Um, but that those windows are probably the best times to book. Now, say that you're all packed, you're ready to go, you're about to go on your first flying adventure. My brother actually uh, flew for the first time uh, in the past year, which is crazy. He's in high school and he's finally getting the opportunity to fly. We've never flown as a family. Uh, We always drive everywhere. Um, We we live in the Midwest, but uh, when we've gone to California or Florida, over 24 hour of a drive, um, we all hunker down and we just rotate through, drive through the night. We're crazy. But we have all um, flown internationally or other things with like high school youth groups, um, with other mission trips we've been on. Um, so, and I've done a decent amount of flying (laughs) now as an adult, um, not with my family, but anyway, so when you arrive, one of the most confusing things to me is actually pulling into the airport. Like there's a million signs and there's a lot of vehicles coming and going and it tends to just be super stressful. (laughs) Um, so one of the first things you need to be looking for is the departure and arrival drop off and pickup areas. Uh, and honestly, I managed to confuse these. Like, when I'm, like, is it I am arriving to the airport or, or is it, um, I have arrived, uh, like, I'm arriving as I drive in or is it like I have arrived and I'm landing from my flight and now someone needs to come pick me up or is it I am departing right now as I drive in and I'm gonna leave on this flight, or is it I'm departing as in I got back to the airport and am now getting in my car to go? Um, That is one of the most confusing things to me, honestly. Uh, So the answer is that departure is the outgoing flight, the people leaving that airport, and the arrival is the people flying in. So um, if it confuses you, think about the flight, don't think about the car. Think about Um, as a flyer, as someone getting on or off the plane, you are flying out to depart and you are flying in to arrive. And so if someone's coming to pick you up, they need to go to arrival, not departure, um, because you as the flyer came in on the plane and you arrived. 
Um, I don't know why that confuses me, and maybe I just made it more difficult for you. But now you know, departure and arrival. Now, when you get there, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to check in and deal with luggage, if you do or don't. Um, so oftentimes now there's electronic kiosks, depending on who you're flying through. Each airline is different, but a lot of them have electronic kiosks, and if you have your ID or passport, you can scan that. Have your code for booking your flight. Um, oftentimes there's a code that comes with that have that with you and uh, you can use that to help log you in and then you can check in. Um, also, a lot of airlines now do mobile check-in, usually 24 hours in advance or, or longer depending on the airline. Um, and so mobile check-in is a great way to just speed up that process. Now, if you have luggage, um, it's likely that you're not going to do the kiosk um, it's likely that you're going to stand in line and have to get your suitcase weighed and they'll put a little tag on it and then they'll wheel it off for you. Now some kiosks, depending on the airline again, you can weigh it there and then put they'll print the sticker for you and you're good to go. But if you have luggage, oftentimes you'll go to a person and they'll check you in online and then, or on their computers and then they'll weigh your suitcase, put a little tag on it so it can be reunited with you, and then they'll send you on your way to your gate. A gate is inside of a terminal. All of this should be printed on your boarding pass, which is what they just gave you. Now, to help planes essentially figure out where to park so that they can get the right people on and off, they kind of give everything letters and numbers. And each airport is slightly different, so I can't tell you exactly what your experience will be like, but this is a good opportunity for you to look up um, any airports are going through their maps. Um, look up them online because you should know their terminals and their gates, just kind of the general format. It'll help reduce some of your stress. So you have your boarding pass. It says maybe you're in Terminal A needing to go to gate 16. A terminal is a section of a building or possibly a separate building. Um, it's basically an area where a bunch of planes can come in. It's a Think of it as like um, if each of your fingers was a different terminal, you could probably get, I don't know, five or six planes on each of them. So great, you made it to the terminal, but which plane do you need to get on? The gate number... So say you're going to gate 16, um, that tells you which exact spot is where your plane will be. So to get to your terminal and to your gate, uh, oftentimes there will be signs up above that say terminal A through G this way and terminal H through whatever this way. So pay attention, be attentive, um, and look for your terminal and head towards your terminal first. Now, if you're at a smaller airport and they don't have a bunch of terminals, and in fact, oftentimes they just have one, um, then go for your gate number because um, it might be gate 10 through 20 over here, but one through 10 over here. And if you go one through 10, you're gonna be scrambling to get back to your flight if you're in gate 16. So this is where, as you're wandering around, um, you are now going to approach TSA. This is where you have to take your shoes off. Any electronic devices need to come out of their bags. This is where any gels and liquids need to get separated. Um, some typical things, this is kind of how I personally approach it. Um, it's it's kind of hard because you have a lot of things in your hands. So first thing they're going to need from you is your ID or passport. Um, they're going to check that in your boarding pass. Make sure you are who you say you are. And then they're going to ask you to take off typically your shoes, belts, jackets, any um, metal objects on you. Go ahead and put those into a container. Um, if you have a computer, any large electronics, put those into a separate container. Any liquids and gels, uh, when you pack, make sure that they are no longer, no larger than three ounces. If you have more than three ounces in a container, 
um, you're going to have some troubles and TSA will make you throw it away. So say you have a water bottle, you come in with it filled, um, they're going to ask you to throw that away. Now, you could take an empty water bottle through and fill it up on the other side. That's okay. But a filled liquid that is more than three ounces, shampoo, gels, conditioners, soaps, anything that you have, um, they will confiscate that. So it has to be three ounces or less. And you go ahead and you send that through. They're going to have you step onto a fun little scanner thing, depending on their method in the airport. Um, and they'll just make sure that you are safe. If they see anything flagged, don't worry about it. Um, just be honest and upfront with them. And they'll double check, make sure you're safe. Every once in a while, they do have to pull someone over um, because they see something in your bag that doesn't meet requirements. Or um, they are just have to pull so many people to make sure that no one's like creating bombs or is a threat. And so... Just follow their guidelines, don't say bomb, don't say, you know, things that are threatening, um, and just be very respectful and you'll be okay. So now, once you're through, pick up your stuff um, and put your shoes on, kind of get yourself recollected, um, make sure it's all there and all packed up well because now you've got to keep this with you at all times, and then head to your gate. I know a lot of people, depending on, like, your time frame, want to like go get food or stop at the little shops along the way my personal recommendation because it's always better safe than sorry is go directly to your gate um one it can be sometimes confusing to get there but two um there's always the chance that your gate could change um there's a storm coming something affects the incoming plane and they change it going there double checking what's on the screen matches what's on your card and like everything's good to go that's important. Then also checking what time that they plan to board. Um, while you might fly out at 2 p.m., typically they're going to board um, anywhere for an hour to 45 minutes ahead of time. They'll start boarding, and the gate might close 30 minutes or 15 minutes ahead of time. So if you show up at 1.55, the gate's already closed, and you can no longer get on the plane. So being there early is key. Having snacks in your bag is important. Um, just things so that if you don't get the chance to do that, um, you're ready. So once you're there, you make sure everything's good. If you have an appropriate amount of time, go ahead and wander. Go ahead and do things. Go to the restroom. Uh, just kind of enjoy yourself and relax because you made it through most of the stressful stuff. But be attentive to time, maybe set an alarm on your watch or something, set an alarm on your phone. Now, if you want to fill up your water bottle, this is a great chance to do that. Wherever you go, do not leave your bags alone. Um, it's just a typical security precaution. Someone could either steal something from you or uh, put something in there that is not your own. So don't leave your bags anywhere. Um, they have to go with you wherever you go. You go to the restaurant, you go to a little shop, they have to come with you. If you do have family or friends with you, it is okay to leave it with them, but make sure that they are watching over your things. An important thing when packing is to keep in mind to have electronics charged and extra chargers on hand. A lot more airports now have the option for you to charge uh, phones and things with a USB outlet. But they're very well fought over, and especially with COVID restrictions and people being spread out, there's no guarantee you're going to have access to that, so just just do your best. Um, I do believe a lot of airports right now are requiring masks and other things. Just make sure you're checking ahead of time. Some even are requiring COVID testing. Just be sure that you are taking every precaution and doing your research ahead of time. So they call your boarding numbers and... So they're going to fill the airport um, kind of following the different sections. Anyone in first class, veterans, anyone with any kind of disabilities typically get boarded first. Um, and then they kind of work their way through economy. It's typically designed so that anyone on the outside rows come in first and then they work their way inward. And they also kind of try and do it, fill it front to back. Um, so... It's broken into different sections depending on the airline. Once you're inside, if you have carry-on items, 
Um, they'll typically tell you to store them overhead or under the seat in front of you. Um, and you have to be able to push it fully under the seat in front of you. You can't have it sticking out or in the way of your feet. Um, so do your best to obey all of those rules. Some things I really recommend that you pack in a carry-on, um, especially if you have luggage, like you're intending to stay for longer periods of time. Um, because there, there have been cases when you're, you do get separated from your luggage. Um, like if you land at an airport and somehow your luggage makes it to the next flight and it carries on without you to your destination, but you get delayed in that town due to a storm somehow and then you don't make it there. It's best, I'd say, to have at least one change of clothes in your suitcase Something to sleep with, like a blanket to keep you warm, like a light throw blanket. And planes tend to get fairly cold. Some snacks, that's always a good thing to have. Again, make sure they follow TSA requirements. So like an apple or granola bar works. But if you're doing like a juicy pouch of applesauce that's over three ounces, I don't know that that would necessarily work. Have some gum so that as you go up and down in the air, uh, you can help pop your ears. And then, of course, have something to entertain you. A book to read, some work to work on, a game to play, a movie to watch. Uh, some airlines do have those options on their flights. A lot of them use Boingo Internet um, to provide you with movies on the plane. But one of the worst things is that I think they typically expect you to download that app before you get onto the plane and then once you're up in the air, you can't download it anymore. So then if it's not already on your phone, even though they might have free movies for you to watch, you can't really watch them. So just be on the lookout for that kind of information ahead of time. Check their websites. Um, check their internet at the airport. Sometimes you kind of get an idea of what you might experience from there. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the airport experience in a nutshell. If you travel internationally, uh, there's a good chance that you will experience jet lag because jet lag is really just this experience of changing time zones and the effects it has on your body. You know, the two times a year where we either fall back or fall forward due to time change and your body's kind of off and you're like, well, I'm hungry, but it's not really supper yet. Or I, I'm awake, but my alarm doesn't go off for an hour. Like, that, those weird sensations, that's a mini version of jet lag. Jet lag, you know, you've traveled and you've maybe hopped five or six time zones, and so now suddenly you're kind of, you're much more off and you have to, like, readjust your body, and it can take a lot of time. If you're going halfway around the globe, I've traveled 14 hours in a plane, and so I went to Australia, and it's like a totally opposite, um, it's a significant time change. So what I did personally was I tried to stay awake on the flight there, um, so that when I got there, I would be tired and then, um, go to bed when we got there. Um, but the same thing can be said about, like, if you get there early, you could still totally just force yourself to stay up, you know, continue to stay up, go through your first day, you'll be a little groggy, but then you'll likely go to bed um, when you need to, and then your body will just kind of force that adjustment a little faster, and then you have to be, like, intuitive about it on the way back. But usually you're pretty exhausted from all your travel adventures, um, and so it might take you a little while um, to, like, totally change back um, for me. But if you have some jet lag tips, totally share those um, on our Facebook and Instagram. You can find links to that on our website, christiantravelers.net. Um, and I would love to hear your advice. How do you deal with jet lag? Um, so those are kind of my flying tips in a nut jar. Um, I have started sharing a weekly travel story with you. And so the one that comes to mind this this week is from a couple years ago. I was in college and flew to Portland, Oregon. Um, I was going to do a semester exchange between some colleges. And when I was there, I flew on Southwest, which Southwest is amazing. I absolutely love Southwest, especially like their luggage deals. You can, like, take two 50-pound 
bags for free. At least it was at the time. And it, it's just, like, some of the best deals in a sense that, I don't know, a lot of other airport airlines I don't think do as good with luggage. Like, there's so many hidden fees. Um, but anyway... I had two 50-pound suitcases. I had loaded one up with clothes and one up with, like, literally all my living supplies. Like, it was just kind of, like, a mad jumble, and they were so heavy. And I'd stayed at home, and I, like, weighed them over and over again until I was absolutely certain, like, they're not going to flag me for, like, being a half a pound over because I can't, like, move it from one suitcase to the next. It's just the way it is. And I would um, I needed pillows for my dorm room, so I took... The, my pillows and I stuff them together to make one really large pillow and because you can take a pillow not even as a carry-on but just as like a personal item with you onto a flight like I had my carry-on and a purse and a pillow and my winter coat plus a coat like I I, I was wearing a bunch of layers of coats and I had this really thick overly large pillow in the seat with me and um I like was trying to check in and I got, let me backtrack for a minute. So I flew my first flight and they're like, okay, there's a super long layover between this one and the next one. So I had, they told me that they wouldn't transfer my bag, which that was not a good thing. And so I had to go get my bag and then get in line to check my bags back in. And this line wrapped around this airport. It was huge. And so I made it a good ways, not a ton, but enough. And I'm just like following these people in front of me. And they'd been in the line this whole time too. And they just like wandered off and I was just following them. And the next thing I know, they're at the, um, they're at TSA, which does not take luggage. Only the check-in does. So now I have to like wander back with my really heavy suitcases and get back in line and whatever. Um, and so it was like two hours to check those bags in. It was crazy. Um, I've never seen that many people waiting in a line before at an airport anyway. And so it was just, it was crazy and it was super heavy. Um, but I got them checked in and I got to my destination and I had chosen to go by like a nickname that I had given myself in Oregon, and so when I got there, my RA, resident assistant um, from the college, she sees me walk by, and she calls this new nickname for me, and I didn't respond, and then I realized, oh yeah, I'm supposed to respond to that now, so then I, like, had to turn around and whatever, and I had never been to this college before, um, I had never had any kind of experience there, I just wanted something new and challenging, um, and I have always loved the story of the Oregon Trail, so I, like, wanted to see some of those things, um, and it was really, I really enjoyed Portland. I liked it a lot. Um, I think a lot of that was just, like, the Christian community I had on that campus. Like, it was just all these people from different denominations witnessing and loving, um, on a very atheist city. Uh, Portland is, like, the highest atheist city in the United States, so, um, that was just a way that I grew in my faith a lot. I, I had to like own my faith in ways I never had before. So that's a little God travel story for you for this week. Um, if you enjoyed today's episode, please head over to google.com and leave us a review. Um, we would really appreciate that. And the next time that you are looking to book your next flight or other travel adventure, um, whether it is with your youth group, with your family, or for yourself, um, or with a college group, or really anything, um, please look to us. I have some amazing suppliers and connections to get you some of those amazing discounted rates. And of course, we have our amazing uh, retreat kit that um, will help enhance your adventures further so that you can in include some of those amazing God moments into your travels um, and make your adventures that much easier. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please share your flight adventures on our posts on Facebook and on Instagram, and uh, also check out other resources on our website, christiantravelers.net. Until next time, safe travels and God bless.